Psalm 40. So last Sunday we talked about the importance of the power of testimony. That your personal story of what God has done in your life is one of the weapons that conquers the power of the enemy. Revelation 12, 10 says it like this, that the saints conquer Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Such a fascinating passage where it's saying the saints conquer Satan. Now we know that ultimately Jesus is the one who conquered Satan and, and this revelation passage talks about how he conquers Satan and throws him out of the heavenly realms and that battle is over, it's done. But Satan, like the Bible says, the enemy of our souls prowls around this earth trying to devour us. And yet this passage says saints in Christ, covered by the blood of Christ, can conquer the power of the enemy. The saints conquer. That's a good word. That's, a, that's an inspiring, encouraging word that the saints can conquer by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And it just speaks to the power of your story, your testimony, what God has done in your life. That is a way that you fight off the lies and the accusations of the enemy. But it doesn't just stop with you. It's meant to go to other people as well. And that's where Revelation 19 10 says that the testimony about Jesus, your testimony, your personal story of what God has done in your life thus far is a spirit of prophecy. Meaning as you share the good news of what God has done in your life in a genuine and authentic way, you share your story and stories of how God has moved, that carries a prophetic word in it saying the God who did that in their life or in your life is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he wants to do it again. And so that's where this power of testimony is, is something that we've come to love and, and, and live on and lean on because God's word tells us to. And so today, a little bit, we want to, as we celebrate God's goodness and faithfulness to the Elevation family, we want to share a little bit of testimony as we dig into God's word in Psalm 40. So as a testimony in a way, it might be kind of a little bit fun for some of you to, to know a little bit of history of where does the name Elevation Church come from? So we promised that we did not copy it from that, that big old church in North Carolina that everyone walks through the doors and like, oh, are you Stephen Furtick's brother? You know, it's like, but we, I, we, we named Elevation. We did not know that church existed. I promise. Did it even exist? I think it barely existed, yes. Yeah. Oh. Finding out later, yes. So the true story is it happened, the name came from the Bible, which we'll see in a moment. It came from wakeboarding. It came from Bono, the U2 singer. And it came from the Holy Spirit speaking on a couple different occasions. And so we'll share that real quick, uh, and then we want to dig into God's Word. So back in college, uh, circa April 1st, 1999, which we shared a little bit of that testimony last week about how God had given us that call into ministry to be a team for His glory. And again, testimony. Man, we got to do that work to know our testimony, as the Bible says. So when the opportunity comes, you can share the hope that you have. How is God real? How is God personal? How is God present in your life? How has he been present? What has he done for you that's transformed you? That is fire and gold that can change other people's lives and fight back the lies of the enemy. So we shared a little bit about that last week. And shortly after we, we got that call in the ministry to be a team for his glory, I was spending time in God's word. And it was just one of those days where the Holy Spirit is speaking so clearly, happened to be in Psalm 40, and there was just this strong sense that, like, this is a life ministry verse for you guys. And we all have those special Bible verses. The more time you, you spend in the Bible, the more you, you'll come away with, you're like, this is my verse. <laughs> yeah, it's mine. God spoke it to me. And then someone else is like, Psalm 40. We're like, wait, I thought God spoke that to me. That's mine. It's my special verse. But hey, that's how God can do it. It can be your special verse and my special verse, our special verse. But there was one of those moments where God was saying, like, this is a life ministry verse for you. And at the time, you know, kind of didn't even make sense in a way. It was just more of like God speaking and saying, hey, I've called you guys into ministry. Here's one of your life verses for ministry. So I want to read it. Just the first three verses for today. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined and heard my cry. He lifted me up from the pit of destruction. 
out of the miry bog and set my feet on a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. So let me fast forward real quick to the elevation name, and then we'll back up to the, just the power of this verse. So this verse had been kind of implanted in our hearts as a ministry verse and that beautiful phrase that he lifted us up, lifted us up out of the pit, had just stuck with us forever. And so circa 2011 now, as we were feeling the call to plant this church and, and what's the name, and, and I happened to be wakeboarding in Canyon Lake behind a boat, one of those beautiful boats that have like a you know, sound system that's worth more than my car, you know, so I can perfectly hear the music back there wakeboarding with, with a friend, uh, his boat, and, and this song came on, and I, and I heard the, the bridge to it. It says, Lord, you lift me up out of the blues. You show me something true. You show me something real. Your love lifts me up. And, and then I hear this you know, ripping electric guitar, elevation. And it was, yeah, yeah, you know. Bono calls me sometimes when he needs, you know, some motivation. Or backup. Some backup, backup, backup. And I was like, bam, there's the name. Like he's quoting Psalm 40 and elevation. And it was just like that Psalm 40 right there. That's what God says. He lifts us up. That's our life verse. And man, it sounds so cool when he sings it. So it was like, bam, there it is. And just got that confirmation that that was, that was going to be a name uh, for the church. But here's why. Psalm 40. Let's go back to it. It is the gospel of the kingdom of Jesus in the Old Testament. As we, as we, as we read it here. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined. He heard my cry. He lifted me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, set my feet on a rock, making my footsteps secure. He put a new song in my mouth a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. So what stood out so clear from that very first moment that has carried us through today and, and carries that heart of God, the heart of the New Testament gospel that Jesus preached so clearly is that God's will, God's heart, God's desire is to lift you up from valley to victory over and over again that that is the kingdom breakthrough that Jesus spoke of in Mark 1.15, where he says, the kingdom of God is at hand, so repent and believe. That is not a one-time situation where the kingdom of God is available once, you repent and believe once, and then it's over. No, there is a beginning, an inauguration, a starting point, but that is the discipleship journey. Until the day you go home with Jesus, that kingdom of God is still at hand and available for more of it. Because none of us are fools enough to say we have fully experienced the kingdom of God. But Jesus has an open-ended invitation that more of the kingdom of God is always at hand. So our job each and every day, till the day we go home with him, is to hear it, see it, be aware of it, see those promises, see his power, see the testimony of what he's done in other people's lives, and say, yes, Lord, I want to turn, I want to repent, I want to say yes, so that I too can grab hold of more of that kingdom. Amen. And that's right there in Psalm 40. It's the same exact message. <sighs> you want to talk? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. I mean, I can't so let's, let's go back and let's break down the good news of Psalm 40 and just get encouraged a little bit here as we, as we get into God's Word. The first thing that stands out, it's so full of these universal gospel truths, true to everyone on the planet. And that's why I'm, I'm so thankful God brought us this verse, showed us this verse, because it's like, Every human on the planet, if they're being realistic, should relate with these truths. And here's the first one. Everyone find themselves in the pit, in the valley, in the miry clay, sooner or later. If you're not real with that, you're lying to yourself. Everybody stumbles and falls and finds themselves in the pit. Sometimes we're in the pit by our own doing. Sometimes we, we know it's going to be the pit, but we, we, we jump into the pit. 
We run into the pit. We see the pit and we just keep going and we fall into the pit. And sometimes we get thrown into the pit, like Joseph got thrown into the pit. Sometimes there's things that are not our fault, that are outside of our control. They are done to us and we end up in the pit. We end up with pain and brokenness. And we look up from life and we're like, dude, I'm in the pit. But whether, whether it's our own doing that got us in the pit or other people's doing that got us in the pit, that is the reality of the broken and fallen world. In this world, we will all end up in the, the miry clay. The, the other translations say it's like a slimy bog. It's a pit, and it's like a slimy, almost like a quicksand picture there. So it's a pit, it's a valley, it's the low point, it's the place you want to be, and you have no power on your own to change it. It's, it's, it's a place where you find your, I'm sorry, it's the place you don't want to be. Thank you. You can stand up here all the time. I'm sure I make these mistakes all the time. I need the editing because they're looking like, what is this guy talking about right now? Grace, I, I bless y'all with a grace filter, <laughs> which you have. But we find ourselves in that pit where we don't want to be, where life is painful, life is hard, there is suffering. And like that quicksand, that miry bog where we're stuck, if we're honest, the pit is too deep, the pit is too steep, we cannot climb out. That is the universal human condition the Bible calls sin. That we get ourselves in the pit and we cannot get out. And if we're honest, that's not a one-time thing. Even after following Christ, even after choosing Christ, we stumble, we fall, we end up back in a pit. And that's where this Psalm 40 good news ends up being the gospel of Jesus Christ over and over that God's will is from valley to victory to lift us up. And that's what we get in the next very phrase, that everyone needs a lift up. We need that elevation. It says it right there. He inclined to me, he heard my cry, and he lifted me up. On our own strength, it's so simple. This is the gospel, but it's just check your life. All those things that you care about. You have this vision for life. I mean, nobody wants to have an awful life. Jesus talks about the abundant life. The devil talks about, or Jesus says that the devil's desire is to steal, steal kill, and destroy. He wants to throw you in the pit. He wants to keep you in the pit. But Jesus came to have that abundant life where we see heaven breaking through and transforming. And so you spend any time around the Bible and you start to get this vision of what life could be like. The fruit of the Spirit is one of those basic benchmarks of what God wants to do in your life. To take you from despair, to take you from self-hatred, to take you from hopelessness, to take you from hate, to take you from anger, lust, bitterness, unforgiveness, all that stuff that's down in the pit that on your own strength you just can't shake it and get rid of it. And Jesus comes along and says, I want to lift you up so that the new normal, the kingdom breakthrough, is that you encounter genuine love to such a degree you can give it away. You encounter such joy that you can give it away. You become, as Psalm 37, I think, or 34 says, those who look to him become what? Radiant. Thank you. we got some Bible lovers in this place. That's, wow, I want to be radiant, don't you? I mean, isn't that attractive on my own? Yeah, I'm like, I'm in the, I'm in the, I'm in the pit, and I'm, I'm taking the miry clay, and I'm, I'm, you know, putting it on my own face. <laughs> it's about the best I can do on my own strength. But God says he wants to lift us up and make us radiant as we look in his face. It's just, it's this basic picture of on our own strength, we remain stuck in the pit and we kind of in a weird way live there and we get all slimy and we roll around in it. We're like that prodigal in the pig slop that for a while just says, I guess that's the best that I can do. I'm going to stay here. And God, but God, <laughs> that's, the whole, that's, that's the whole message of the Bible. This is kind of the gospel 101. You want to read the whole Bible? Here it is in like a sentence. God has this great destiny that you will know him and be in relationship with him and live this abundant life. We all mess it up really bad and end up in the pit and can't do anything about it. 
but God. That's it right there. But God. But God's heart is even when you're in the pit, even when you're staying there, even when you can't get out and you're trying, you're, you're putting more slime on your face, but God comes. He hears and he lifts us up out of the pit. And so a great way to, to celebrate God's goodness is to just take a moment and look back and say, what has he lifted us up out of? What has he lifted you up from? Anytime you're having a rough day, that's a great question right there. Just to reflect back, to start ins inspiring that gratitude and praise. What has God lifted me up out of already? That begins to evoke praise and gratitude and hope that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So what he's done before, he's going to do again. And where does he lift us up? It's very clear. He, lift us, he lifts us up onto the solid rock. The solid rock. This is an echo forward into the teaching of Jesus from Matthew 5 to 7, the greatest sermon ever, the great sermon on the mount that finishes with Jesus saying what? Anyone who hears my words and does them is the one who builds their life on a rock. Anyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't do them is building their house on the sand. And when the storms come, because they're going to come, that's the same picture of like the pit. When the storms of life come, if you don't have the solid rock, you are going to get blown away. Everything is going to get washed away. And what does he say? It'll come down with a mighty crash. That's life without God. And a mighty crash it can be. That's that pit of destruction, that pit of despair. That's what we can do on our own strength. But God wants to lift us up and help us learn how to build our life on the one true rock of Jesus Christ as we follow him. A couple more quick things, and then I'll give it over to my wife for her to bring the fuego and bring us home. You ready right now? Either way. I could. Either way. <laughs> I feel the heat of the Lord on the words, a song to sing, and resurrection power. And I feel like right now his um, fire is burning inside of us. And I feel this um, sense that as we go through the week with the obstacles that we're facing, with the challenges that we're facing, with whatever it is that we are trying to partner with God to bring the kingdom, that there is an actual anointing on the song inside of our hearts. That, you know, sometimes you don't feel a song. Sometimes it's hard and you don't feel a song. And I feel like um, a specific word from the Lord that as we engage in the song, even when we don't feel like, like it, that there are glory gates of heaven that open, and that is true because he is enthroned on the praises of his people. His presence comes in when we feel bogged down and in a pit. Honestly, this is a daily remedy and a daily way to usher the kingdom in, to birth the kingdom when it feels like, you know, nothing's coming and you're stuck. This makes the birthing of the kingdom sweet and swift and it breaks in. So I feel like there's a word from the Lord that as we partner with him, as we worship him, because this is really worship. What this is, is what God are you worshiping? So as we're looking at the hard day, as we're looking at the difficult circumstances that are in front of us, whatever it is, because he cares about everything, and that's also super important to know that he cares about everything. Don't dismiss anything as not being worthy of the power of God transforming, because what that's doing is, well, he paid the price on the cross so that he could redeem absolutely everything. So there is something that comes, um, and there, there's a worship, because in that moment when we're facing the, the hardness of whatever is going on, 
and we take his hand and by faith just say, I'm going to sing a song. I'm singing your song over this situation. Whatever it is, ask him to put a song in your heart. Play a worship song. Sing a verse. Sing promises that he's made over you. But as we do that, we're no longer, um, our heart is not in a place of fear, of staring at the problems that the enemy is, you know, meddling around in, which in a sense, if all we're doing is staring at that, that's kind of like worshiping what he's doing. I mean, like fear is kind of that, you know? And, and I'm guilty of fear all the time. That's honestly a feeling that comes up in my heart all the time. I have to go to God. And, and those are natural emotions. But what we need to do is when we stay in that place of fear, it's really worshiping the enemy and your problem as being bigger than God. So in that place, in that childlike place, because we don't, we're not perfect. We're not meant to have it perfect. When I sing and when I start singing so frequently, it's not from a place of incredible faith, but it lights a fire. It shifts the atmosphere. The, the, the um, heavenly, we're in the heavenly realm. Um, the demonic hates worship <laughs> because it brings the kingdom of God. It's just like, ah, you know, like in, in back in the day when we, you know, first kind of started in like some deliverance ministry, it, we, we were like little kids. And so it was in a sense, like a little bit funny to us. But when we started singing worship songs, sometimes they would start screaming and then just leave. When, I mean, anyways, but it's not really funny, but it is, it's kind of, you know, it's a joke on the devil. It's ha ha. You get to watch you worship and you can go run back to where you belong. Um, so anyways, I feel like there's a tool that God is giving us that as we pursue him in worship in those times that there's like a, like a lighting up, a flame within that will bring his kingdom and his power burning around us. So just, um, it's an encouragement to sing that song of praise, to sing that redemption song, to sing that new song. And just like, um, Mark 11, 22 to 24 says, if <laughs> you said, I'm too tired to remember it perfectly right now. Yeah, yeah, uh, me too. Uh, Pray as if you've already received it. So there's, there's a praise where you sing redemption song before you've seen the redemption take place. That will usher in the kingdom right there. That will put out the enemy beneath your feet. So that is a powerful tool as we sing redemption song before we've seen the redemption take place. And as we stand in agreement, because Colossians talk about how we are seated in the heavenly places, we are standing in, ag in agreement with what has already been accomplished for us in heaven. And our agreement is what brings that plummeting, that plunging, that birthing of the kingdom of God to earth. I think it's pray, believing you have received it, and it will be yours. So Mark 11, 24. That's a, what she's sharing is a present word right now that I believe has, has got some Holy Spirit fire on it about a tool to sing and praise, believing you have received it, and it will be yours. And that's, that's power. Um, I want to highlight from verse 3 the incredible, hopeful, inspiring truth that every soul has a song to sing. When you look at this, the progression in this Psalm 40, where it talks, you know, that I cried out, I'm in the pit. He lifted me up. He set my feet upon a rock. He gave me a new song to sing. I love the progression of that because it's like, we're in the pit. We can do nothing. He lifts us up, but he doesn't just give us a strong foundation. That's kind of like structure and, and power. But then here comes like the overflowing kind of love affair artistry. Your soul is singing. And there's like different aspects. They're both needed. Like we need strength. We need foundation. We need pillar. We need structure. But man, if there's not a joyful noise to sing, then what's the point? 
You know what I'm saying? So there's both in here. There's power, strength, structure, but then it's like every single person on the planet has this childlike, dancing, lighthearted soul to sing, song to sing. And it's like, I, I get that. Like, I don't, well, don't want to just be strong. I want to be full of joy. I want a song to flow out of me. When no one's looking, I want to have the feeling to dance. Not because I'm scared that I'm not a good dancer. Well, maybe that's part of it. No, it's because the point is, I, I, I want to feel that. I want to live that. I want to have that joy of the Lord that is in there to such a degree that when no one's looking, and here's the point, it's for nobody else, for no one else not to look good, not to please anybody, not to impress anybody, but when me, alone with the Lord, I want to have such a real relationship with him that my soul wants to start singing and dancing for no one else but him and me because he's that real. And, and, and that's what this psalm is saying, that that's a universal truth. That that's how God created you, to have a personal song to sing. That, it, 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 that is the picture of a soul that is vibrant, a soul that is full of vitality, a soul, a soul that is alive, a soul that has abundance overflowing. And that is the heart of God for each and every one of you. That's some good news. That God's heart is not that we walk around just kind of like, barely alive, just surviving. No, he wants you thriving to where you can't wait to get alone <laughs> and get away from people so you don't have that pressure performing and, 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 and appeasing and, and, and you know, appealing to and, and all that stuff. And you're just like, because my soul's got a song to sing. That's life, and God has it for each, every one of us. And that soul song, that, that solid rock, that story to tell, listen to now verse 3, it says that everyone now, you have a story to tell that will bless, encourage, and lift up others. So here's the testimony again. It says, verse 3, and many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. That's for everybody. You think all you're worth is having a life in the pit? God says, no way. He says, heaven, no. I'm going to lift you up. And I'm going to put your feet on a rock. And I'm going to give you a new song to sing. And that song that you sing is going to bless others so that many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Your personal story of the goodness of Jesus in your life is meant then to be sung, to be shared, and others get blessed. And lastly, where we finish is, and God gets the glory. Verse 3. This is a song of praise, this new song. What's that song about? How great you are? No. It's about how great God is. A song of praise to our God. And what happens? Many will see and fear, and that's a good thing, meaning being brought, brought into a proper reverence of who God is. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. So that is, and after all of this, what is the end result? You're in the pit. I'm in the pit. We can't do anything on our own but God lifts us up by his grace, sets our feet on, our, on the rock of Jesus Christ, experience, we experience him to such a degree in personal relationship that our soul overflows with a song. Other people encounter that and they say, but God. They say, not you, but God. And they're drawn and attracted to Jesus and God gets the glory. It's a pretty good deal. <laughs> All right. I have a couple um, great verses that I felt like the Lord spoke to me to kind of um, meditate on, you know, now and throughout the week as we are coming to him and just asking him, like Ephesians 1 talks about, to open the eyes of our hearts to take us deeper in this song. Um, so in this song in our hearts, in the in the story of Psalm 40, which is redemptions, the story of God's redemption in our lives. Um, and as we ask him to take us deeper in learning how to sing that redemption song, you know, as I had mentioned. So this is Luke 4, 18. I'm going to read a few different translations. Let's see, which one do I want to start with? 
The spirit, of, this is NIV, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. New living, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free. And those words there are in tandem. You know, it's the blind will see, there's a physical, and there's also a supernatural, like Ephesians 1 talks about opening the eyes of our heart. Um, you know, and like uh, 2 Corinthians, ta- is it 3, 16? Um, but he, he transforms us from glory to glory. As we behold him, he transforms us from glory to glory. So there is a seeing and more seeing. As, as we look at him, as we behold him, we see him and he transforms us. Our eyes see, our eyes look at him and then our eyes see what he is saying. Our eyes see what he wants to do on the earth and we partner with that in saying, yes, Jesus, your glory come. You know, and this is a very... Um, real and practical tool that I'm actually going to give you right now that I feel like the Lord just um, brought to mind. So our agreement, right, empowers a kingdom. Matthew 6, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Um, That is actually a command. Kingdom of God come, will of God be done. That's how Jesus taught the disciples to pray. And we're going to go into a few messages that are going to be all about how Jesus taught us to pray, which I'm really excited about, and I feel the heat of the Holy Spirit on that. But um, anyways, the point is that our agreement empowers the kingdom. So when you're bitter, when you have bad thoughts towards people, when there needs to be forgiveness, you're empowering a kingdom. I'm guilty of that. I regularly, daily, need to check my heart because there's people that I've forgiven and they do something else. And uh, and I'm like, uh, and if I stay in that place of being irritated with them, I'm partnering with the work of the enemy that's pissing me off, right? And I'm empowering it. So I've learned this. It's this really, really simple little tool, and I've been doing it all the time, and I have actually seen so much breakthrough in it. Um, so what I do is when I feel that yuck, sometimes sometimes um, because I'm very wired to see and feel the spirit realm, sometimes I'll just walk into a room and I just feel like a demonic flurry over there or something. Now, I know that's not normal for most people. It's just kind of how I'm wired. Or there's just somebody that just is irritating and they bug me, or they're doing something again that we've already like talked about a million times. Now, that's not to say that you are not supposed to be honest with relationships and talk things out, because if you don't do that, then you're partnering with the enemy to, you know, build a wedge between you and that person, and we are effectively bringing a blockage to the body of Christ so that it's not able to function as it should. Um, But anyway, so this tool has been really amazing for me, and I've been kind of applying a couple different verses, and one of them is that we're seated in heavenly places in Colossians, right? So when I feel that feeling of, you know, I'm out, like that, you know, whatever it is is bothering me, or whatever I'm sensing, do I stay there? No. I immediately cut that off, you know, and some people, like, they have this thing that it's like, oh, it's a gift of discernment. Well, it's not a gift of anything if you're just partnering with the devil and like looking at what he's doing and then condemning God's children instead of partnering with who God created them to be so that you can see the beauty in them, call out the gold, and be a part of God's transformation and setting them free. Um, Anyways, so my practical way that I've been doing that is I feel that I remember Colossians, the verse in Colossians, it's either one or three. I love one, two, and three in Colossians. There is three. We're seated in heavenly places. So I go to that place where I'm with my daddy God. I just take a moment and I'm just, you know, go to that place of worship, of just being with him, with him in a, com- in a communion with him. And I just, it's almost like I'm not even saying these words in my head, but I mean, I'm not saying the words out loud, but it's just really quick and it's 
sitting in his lap or being next to him or holding his hand or whatever I feel like at that moment and feeling his heart. And instead of me looking at that person and feeling the yuck of like, ooh, those are some issues or yuck, I don't like that. Daddy, who did you create them to be? See them how he made them to be in heaven. Not how the devil has messed things up and, you know, people have, everybody has a story. Most of the issues that we see in people that bother us, if we actually looked at their story, we'd probably be sobbing at the, what they had experienced that brought them to that point. So often people aren't even aware of that because they just shut things down so they can survive because life's been hard and life's been painful. So what I do in that moment is I've honestly been learning to shut off my brain with that negative stuff. So when I sent, if I sent something or if I'm feeling something negative, I'm shutting it off, going to Jesus. How do you see them? And then I'm just asking him, when I look at them, I'm seeing who you made them to be. I'm calling that out. I'm standing in agreement with them, with that. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm calling things out and yelling things all day. That gets exhausting, right? I bind you. I see you. I release the kingdom of God, da-da-da. Like, intercession is awesome, and it's a part of who we're supposed to be, but we're meant to just be with Jesus all day. We're meant to abide in him, and abiding isn't working all day, binding and releasing. That is a part of it, but if we do that all day, we're going to be exhausted, and because I am, you sense and think things all day, I've just kind of learned to do this as an exercise where the point of it is I'm with my daddy. I'm abiding in Jesus. And it also makes me feel a lot better because thinking yucky thoughts, it's like that's what you're abiding in. If you like think an irritated thought about somebody, you're just like, Ugh, I don't like that person. I don't like what they did. Well, she's rude. You know, whatever it is, you're abiding in that place. So it takes you to a much better place if you are abiding with the king. You're in his presence because, you know, he's not thinking those bad thoughts about them. He, even the things that you think are spiritual, oh, well, they should be doing this. Where is the spirit of God at work? Where is he moving? That's what God is doing. Jesus did what the father was doing. If we're looking at all the stuff, even in the Christian realm, that they're supposed to be doing that they're not, we are removing ourselves from the presence of God and from his spirit because he's their good daddy. He adores them. He is, he loves them. He's looking at the gold in them and his spirit is moving to do something in them to bring his kingdom and his love and his goodness. But it's certainly not condemnation. He did not come to condemn the world and that's not our job either. That's the devil's job. He came to love the world, to set the world free and to bring his kingdom in every area. So anyways, that's a very simple exercise that I've been doing. And I've been seeing so much breakthrough, you know, because when somebody's kind of wronged you, you can regularly forgive them. But do you ever notice, like, when you think of that person, you just have, like, the yucky feeling, the yucky thought. It's just kind of like, ugh, like, that's not remedied yet. So if I ever think of those, whoever, you know, that person is, I'm cutting off the negative feelings and I'm partnering with agreeing with God and really seeing them how he made them and saying, yes, daddy, this is how you made them. Sometimes it's just words. Sometimes it's thank you that you made them happy and free and compassionate. You know, if it's somebody who's being really selfish, you know, thank you that you made them compassionate. Thank you that you healed their heart to feel your love. Um, and sometimes it's not words. Sometimes it's, it's just like a, it's an agreement of me being with him abiding with my father, and then almost like this feeling of being in the heavenly places, and I see them as he sees them. When I, when I, when I think of them, my agreement is for, is just almost like that verse that we mentioned earlier that we both totally botched. Um, we're in agreement, and we're praying as if it's already there, because it's who he made them to be. All right, and that is how oh, we can actually, partner to lift others up. Yes. Um, the, uh, there's two other verses. Um, Psalm 108. I'm really loving it in the Passion Translation. I won't read it all right now. I'll, let, I'll leave you to meditate on that and chew on that when you go home. But um, So Luke 4.18, I already mentioned Psalm 108, um, verses 1 through like 4 or 5. Um, and then also there's Psalm 30. 
and I love the New Living. So uh, one, verses one through, I think four-ish, yeah, one to four. So take those home, take those home and meditate on those and just kind of chew on them and let the glory of the Lord fill your heart as you read them. Meditation on the Word is absolutely transforming, and without it, we will be lifeless. Let's pray and close our time. Heavenly Father. I will sing a new song. I will sing a new song. I will dance.